Good afternoon. Welcome to session four of European Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Stanford Engineering. My name is Burton Lee. I'm the course instructor here. Today we're very pleased to be featuring speakers out of Austria and Denmark. Uh, Mikkel Svana, who is CEO and co-founder of Zendesk, and Martin Reiter, who is former head of international growth for Airbnb and Groupon. Today we're going to be focusing on European entry and expansion strategies for Silicon Valley startups. Uh, both of these speakers have a very broad range of experience with bringing startups, Silicon Valley startups, to Europe uh, in many, and in many other different geographic locations. Mikkel, thank you for coming all the way from San Francisco <laughs> <laughs> to be with us today and to tell us the Zendesk story. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I had no idea what I went into, but, <laughs> but it's good to see everybody. Uh, how many here already know a little bit about Zendesk? That's nice. Thank you. How many here are customers? Excellent. <laughs> awesome. I take credit cards afterwards if anybody else are interested. Um, but, uh, but today, uh, so I thought I'll, I'll give you a little background on both me and like the early days of Sendesk uh, and uh, what we actually do. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how it was in the old days, how we approached the world as a bootstrap startup, to finally talk a little bit about how, uh, what our growth strategy is today when we are a much more mature company and are figuring out how to address the, the different markets. So let me start out a little bit about the background here. I was told to put in a map <laughs> to show everybody where I'm from. So this is Europe. <laughs> it's like pe when people ask me, where is Alabama? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> so this is uh, Denmark in Europe. Um, we are part of the, sometimes the Scandinavian region, which is Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. And sometimes we, we talk about we're part of the Nordic region, which is also uh, Finland and Iceland. No? Yes. Um, Iceland, which is way up there to the north. Um, our biggest trading partner is Germany. Um, and we also sometimes call the, the holiday area for Germany, the vacation area for Germany. Is that, can I say, is that political correct? No. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so all righty, we got that covered. This is the state of Sendes today. We are a company with uh, a little over 500 employees. Um, I have here to with me today, I have Laurie, who runs our recruiting, director of recruiting. Say hi, Laurie. She's also a Stanford alumni. And you're on the, I think you're on the board of the alumni thingy. Alumni Association. Alumni Association, yes. Um, so uh, Laurie onboarded most of, uh, hired and onboarded most of these 500, a little over five, how, what is the precise, precise number now? 540, and we're at that rate where we hire something like 10 people every week, so it's a little hectic, but it's very interesting. Uh, we, did, we, we raised a lot of funding uh, from a lot of great partners. Uh, founded in 2007, out of Denmark, our headquarters is today in San Francisco, and we have smaller or bigger offices all over the world. We have engineering facilities in Melbourne, in uh, Copenhagen, and in Dublin, and in Dublin we also have a European data center. And then we have uh, APAC main offices out of Melbourne, where it runs our APAC operations, and our uh, European operations out of London. Uh, and then we have smaller sales offices in Berlin, in Sao Paulo, and in Tokyo. And finally, we also have an office in Manila, where we run most of our Southeast Asian operations. So that's the state of the business today. And <laughs> I can't really say that all of these offices were totally well planned. Oh, I forgot Madison, by the way, which is a new uh, office we set up just because it was getting so crazy hiring here in San Francisco. We said, OK, let's find another place where we can hire great people too, and we found Madison. Uh, so I can't really say that all of this has been super planned. We've, a lot of it has been very opportunistic, maybe except for something like Dublin, where we said we had a very strategic, we made a very strategic decision, say, okay, let's put a data center here, and while we put a data center here, let's build an engineering team, and then more team around that, because it's a great place to hire. All right, but 
also, I should say, we have more than 30,000 businesses all around the world relying on Zendesk as their customer service platform, amongst them both Airbnb and Groupon, uh, but also a ton of other types of companies like Disney and Adobe uh, and these kind of companies. We also have a lot of small businesses, but I'll, I'll get back to that a little later. Let me uh, take you back to the, uh, so this is our product, ta-da! Um, <laughs> beautiful, simple customer service software. And normally I have a video that <laughs> introduces uh, both Zendesk, what the product does and how we market ourselves to the public and kind of the branding and all that stuff. But we don't have keynote on this computer so we can't show the video. It's a very good video so you can go to our website and you can see it. Anyways, these are the early days of Zendesk. This is five years ago and that's basically the entire company at that point in time. We were three guys. Out of, a, out of a loft in uh, Copenhagen, uh, smoking and drinking like you do in Europe. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, building this company. Two of us been in the industry for a few years, implementing these type of solutions for large organizations and were um, underwhelmed by the level of innovation and what was happening in that space. Uh, so we decided to build this company and I think also part of it was also very much driven by the fact that we were getting old and like settled and I think like we had this, we had this feeling that if we wanted to do something we had to do it now before it was too late. So that was the background for building this. So we bootstrapped it for a couple of years and when I say bootstrap I really mean bootstrap. Like this was out of, we worked out of Alexander's loft and you know this was basically our surroundings for a few years. It was very cozy, like it's a very romantic period. It's of course also a very stressful period because you have no validation for your product or your idea or anything and you don't know if like, are we crashing next month or you know, will we have for another month? You have no idea. So it's, it's very romantic but it's of course also stressful if, especially if you have like a family and have people that rely on you and you have to support and so on. But you'll find out once you start your own companies. So, <laughs> Silicon Valley. <laughs> we were definitely like, we were definitely, we definitely had like this American dream. We were reading TechCrunch too. And like see, hearing about all these stories, it's amazing, especially when you're in Copenhagen. When being in, in Copenhagen, being a technology startup is, it, it's not being taken really seriously. It's, it's like, it's cute, it's a hobby. You can sit there with your computer. Um, but you're not part of an industry, you can't raise any money, there's no networking opportunities, no nothing like that. So reading about all these great things happening here in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, just like, oh, it's, it's like, I think if you're like a designer, you wanna go to Paris or to Milan, and if you're in, the, if you're in banking, you wanna go to London or to New York. Uh, I think for us, it was just very obvious that home was San Francisco and Silicon Valley. So in that regard, we were lucky. Um, and started talking, started pitching uh, American VCs and raised some money that could bring us over here and then like one thing took the other and we were uh, st started to grow like crazy and raise more money and raise more and so on. So we built this cloud-based customer service product and of course time has been on our side. Five years ago, uh, nobody, I have some animations here normally, Five years ago, nobody took, no, the cloud wasn't like a certain thing. It wasn't certain that all enterprises would put all their software and all their business applications in the cloud. We feel much more certain about that today, but five years ago, nobody really, you know, it was, you couldn't take that for granted. Like Salesforce was still a very new thing at that point in time, especially in the, in the rest of the world. So the cloud, Adoption has definitely, that trend has definitely helped our business tremendously. The consumerization of IT has changed the market completely. You, you used to sell enterprise software like top down, you sold it into the CIO or the CEO. Nowadays you can build beautiful stuff and you can sell it into the actual users of the software and they will take it around in the organization and say, shouldn't we use this? It's fantastic, it's cool. So you you're suddenly change the dynamics of selling and that also changes your your uh, expense profile so it becomes much cheaper sell and you can sell the product much cheaper. 
And then, of course, mobile. Again, like, what is the iPhone today, five years old? Uh, and now, like, I can see all these phones and everything here. Like, we all want to bring our applications with us on the go. We expect that. Um, and being a child of that generation has definitely kind of changed the, the competitive landscape because like, it's really hard for the legacy players in this space to follow along with the mobile, uh, with the mobile revolution. So all of these uh, uh, trends have helped us tremendously. I have another cool animation here that you're not going to see, but customer service also has changed over these five years. Five years ago, customer service wasn't very cool. Nobody cared about it. You didn't pick up any chicks in the help desk, as we said. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but uh, the thing is, like, the voice of the customer has never been louder than it is today. As a consumer, as a customer, we have so much power. Uh, we, can, we can share our bad experiences and influence a lot, of, a lot of people. At the same time, we can also share our good experiences and thereby become promoters and evangelists for brands. It's very hard today to hide a bad customer service experience because it's out there, it's in the open. Whereas just five, ten years ago, if somebody had a bad experience, you know, it happened in a vacuum. Nobody really cared outside that world. You really had to make a, a tremendous effort to get people outside of that vacuum to listen. Nowadays, just post it on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever, boom, it is out there. So all these channels has dramatically changed the landscape of customer service just over the last five years. And for us, that has meant tremendously. It's really changed our business. And then, of course, like customer expectations are changing rapidly. Like, I don't know how many here use Uber or these kind of services. It's completely changed how we use, uh, how we use so many different things. Like, it has to be instant. We want transparency, and it's super personal. That's just our expectations of services today. So the, the customer expectation, consumer expectation has changed dramatically, and more and more companies are realizing how important that is. So that's other trends that have made it very, very, uh, that has accelerated our growth as a company tremendously. And did we know anything, anybody, anything about this when we started the company? Not at all. Um, all righty. So uh, we are a small startup. We're bootstrapped. We're out of Copenhagen. We're working out of a loft. And how do we launch this product? So. The traditional way of thinking about launching products is that you optimize it for like a segment, like focus on what you really do well and like focus very intensely and do only that. That's like one of the mantras when you build products and companies and so on. I think we did, we did the opposite. Instead of focusing on like a market we knew well, on an industry we knew well, on a company size we knew really well, we tried to focus on a lot of low-hanging fruits. <laughs> um, because first and foremost, um, there are companies in Australia that think exactly the same way as companies in uh, Ireland or in Turkey. There are companies in the B2C industry thinking completely the same way as customers in the B2B industry. There are companies in the travel sector that think exactly the same way as companies in the Web 2.0 sector, whatever we want to call it. There are companies for there are companies with 10 employees who think the same way as companies with a thousand employees. So if you can kind of if you can if you can if you instead of kind of focusing very narrowly on a market you can address really well, focus very, very broadly on companies all around the world, and then just pick the low-hanging fruits, suddenly you could get out and get a lot of, in many ways, very similar customers, but from all around the world. And that helped us. We had, <coughs> we had almost 10,000 customers before we started ramping up like a sales team. Until then, it was all just customers coming to us, uh, accepting the use case and buying the software on their own. So I have another animation <laughs> that shows how, uh, how we've always focused on the similarities in the market. So we've always focused on what makes Australia similar to Turkey. What makes the B2B industry similar to the B2C industry? What makes the travel sector the same as the, some other sector? And focus, try to focus on the similarities of those markets and 
The thing is that with time, so the, these two circles kind of, you know, you have to focus them um, covering each other more and more. With time and technology, we believe that, th that similar the similarities between the different markets will grow. Was that clear? Also without the animations? <laughs> Good. All right. So that's, that's how our initial kind of approach was. Like make things very, very easy. We didn't pretend like we didn't, we pretended like we were an international company. We didn't say we are this small Danish startup or anything like that. We pretended to be a, an international company and then focusing on customers all over the world that had kind of the same use case or kind of the same needs that we could fulfill with the same products. And that accelerated, made it very easy for us to reach a very broad audience in a relatively short time period. So, but. After a certain while, when you, when you continue to grow, you have to be more systematic in your approach. And I'm just going to share some of the thoughts and some of the uh, kind of principles we use for that. First and foremost, <coughs> we, look, we use these axes. First of all, you can address small businesses, very small businesses, or you can address kind of the mid-market, the large organizations, and the enterprise organizations, the very large organizations. And then you have different industries that are some of these industries are very early adopters of uh, software or new technologies and so on and some of these are very late adopters more mainstream companies so the early adopters small businesses that's typically like companies like good startups technology startups small businesses very agile very early adopters of new technology that can give them a competitive advantage <laughs> That segment is, for a company like us, is very, very easy to approach. It's also relatively small and it's somewhat uncertain because some of these companies come and go. But small market, easy to address, uh, easy, to, uh, easy to sell to. And that's also why you see our software, you see that in a lot of startups like Airbnb, like Groupon, like Twitter, like Dropbox, like Box, like Yammer, like Eventbrite and all these kind of companies. All right. When you get up a little bit more, you still have some companies that are kind of early adopters. I'll give you a few examples afterwards. But you still see some companies that are still like some industries that are still early adopters of this kind of, of, of new technology, but they become more mid-market enterprise. That also means that they start to have <coughs> they start to have different requirements. They start to look at you from like a security audit perspective. They want to negotiate the contracts and all these different things that start to make the uh, sales process much more expensive. That's why it suddenly gets much more expensive to penetrate that market, but it's still somewhat easier and of course larger than the small early adopters. Then you have the traditional kind of mainstream mid-market and enterprise market. <coughs> that market is huge. Like big companies, they buy a lot of stuff. Uh, but they also like, they're not early adopters, so a sales cycle is like one year or two years. It takes forever to get anything done, um, and they have to get, they have to drag you through legal negotiations and security reviews and penetration tests, not the fun ones, and all these different things to kind of, to verify your product and your uh, proposition. So it's expensive, it's complicated, but it's a vast market. That also means that suddenly your sales costs are high, and then you have to price your product after that. All right, the last market is kind of the small business mainstream market. That's all the little shops that you see and all the little businesses that you see locally. It's, that's a really hard market to penetrate because they are all, they're not, none of them are alike. They're very, very different. And it's very hard to find kind of common denominators between these businesses. We've been relatively successful in that market, even though it's very complicated. But companies like, for example, Intuit are doing extremely well in that market because they can sell financial systems to all of these companies because all of these companies need it. So let me give you a few examples. What are we talking about here? Like a small, uh, small startup like Coin. How many here know Coin? So is this universal credit card? 
super, super sexy. Out of the gates, a lot of success, needs to manage all this customer service. For us, they use Zendesk up and running in a week. Boom, fantastic. Like really good, easy uh, customer for us. Then you have a customer like Open Table, for example. More mature company, they're a public company, there's all kinds of requirements, longer sales cycles and so on, but they still have, they're still like an innovative kind of, they're still in an innovative, disruptive industry with a lot of innovation happening. Xerox, then suddenly it becomes very traditional mainstream enterprise. Uh, if you want to sell into Xerox, it takes forever and you have to go through all these different processes and legals and I don't know what. So that's why if you want to penetrate that market, you typically need to adapt your t approach, your strategy. And for example, not focus on selling enterprise-wide licenses, but selling into different departments within these companies and then take it from there. And then of course you have the mainstream small businesses. I don't know, how many here know Copy Factory? None? All right, done. So <laughs> it's just a small copy shop here in Palo Alto somewhere. But like a good example of like, there's millions of these businesses, but they're all very different. And it's very, it's very complicated to sell into all of them in kind of the same way. So uh, an example of how to uh, look at your market once you start maturing and looking into how to, your different growth strategies. So the thing about the thing about the different, the thing about that kind of way of uh, uh, thinking about your market is, of course, that not all markets are equal. You know, some, in some countries, like if you want to find, identify the early adopters for your, comp your product, you can only find it in the software industry, in the Web 2.0 industry, in kind of pure play e-commerce, in gaming, and so on. But there are other markets where uh, both like media, uh, tech, telcos, travel, some uh, these kind of companies are much more uh, innovative, much more early adopters of new technology. These are some of our findings, but it varies a lot uh, in the different markets. Uh, and you have to, so basically the, the bottom line here is that that kind of figuring out which industries, which markets to address, you have to perform like an individual maturity test of the different markets to figure out like how innovative, how uh, mature how early, what are the early adopters in that market. Is that clear? All right, I'm trying to hurry here because... No, no worries. All right, cool. <laughs> okay, excellent. So, um, so, uh, so this, is, this is how we see the world right now. We have some markets where, um, where we are all focused on continued growth. So meaning, do what we do today, and do it better, and then focus on new channels, new, uh, put, new possibilities in those markets to accelerate the growth. These are markets for us that are typically the English-speaking markets because that's the, that's the biggest kind of uh, common denominator amongst these markets. So that's markets like US, UK, Australia, these kind of markets. We have other markets where we have uh, opportunistically uh, created a presence there. That means that typically we have around a thousand customers or something like that. And uh, where we can see that we have to change our tactics in the country. We have to do much more localized stuff. We have to have localized marketing, localized support, localized uh, uh, sales, localized everything basically localized currencies, all these different things to further penetrate that market. And these are some of our, uh, these are a, a select few markets for us where we overinvest to, uh, to be able to continue our growth. Then we have other markets where we have the potential for continue, we have the potential for growth there. It haven't really established itself as a, as a market we really believe in, like we have still only have like a few hundred customers or something like that. Um, but we can see like if we provide opportunistically, if we provide some uh, localized field support, if we provide some localized sales support and marketing, uh, we can grow that market and maybe make it, uh, making it an established market that we can start over investing in. And these are, these are markets like Russia, Italy, Turkey, uh, Malaysia, some of these markets. Finally, like we have the rest of the world. 
And that's, you know, all the other countries where it's, like, it's hard to predict what happens in those regions. Um, it's hard to predict our growth. Um, and where we have to be completely optimistic with providing some kind of field-based uh, evangelism. All right, this was a very quick overview. I, th I hope I kept within like the time frame here. But that was to show you a little bit about how was our original thinking in growing these countries, where it was all about finding the similarities between all the different markets and pick as many kind of low-hanging fruits as possible. Two, then when we had a certain level, now we have more than 30,000 customers using Sendesk. Two, then uh, figuring out a more <coughs> targeted way of addressing kind of the different markets as we approach these different uh, regions. All right, and I think kind of that was what I prepared. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mikkel. So, um, what would your recommendation be to Silicon Valley enterprise software startups that are looking to expand to Europe? Where, where should they jump to first? What are the challenges they'll face in moving to Europe? What are the pitfalls, traps they should avoid? So, the, the, the lowest hanging fruits in Europe are definitely like the, the countries where they speak the language. You know, so and and of course the UK is the far the biggest market to address in uh, Europe, and it's the easiest market to address for an, uh, for a US company. Um, then there are regions where uh, English is not the first language, but maybe the second language, and everybody speaks it. And you know, typically smaller markets where they realize that their language will never be a leading language in the world. So these are, for example, the Scandinavian Nordic region, uh, Benelux, uh, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Luxembourg. But then, of course, if you try to go into France, if you try to go into Germany, Spain, Italy, you have to localize. There's, like, there's definitely low-hanging fruits in all these uh, countries. But if you really want to go deep in Germany, have to speak the language have to have content in uh, German, have to have marketing in German, all these different things. And you have to have you know, German people on the ground because it's still, in many ways, a more conservative way of doing business. And like they need that kind of face-to-face -face time to buy enterprise software. Um, so um, yeah, so I think that sums it up. France, same thing. People on the ground, drink red wine, all that stuff. Italy. <laughs> what are the most common mistakes Valley startups make when going to Europe? So I don't know. I don't know. I think that uh, <laughs> I think that uh, one of the things is that I think it's easy for for U.S. companies to think about Europe as one market, uh, and it's definitely not. It's 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 a lot of very very different markets. Uh, there's definitely differences, you know, like it's not the same thing doing business in California as in Texas or in Florida, but it's nowhere near so different as it is, as it is doing business in, you know, Finland and Spain, which is just like <laughs> worlds apart. Is there anyone from Finland here? <laughs> yeah. <Italy. laughs> is there anyone from Spain here? <laughs> And the thing about Finland is they all wear knives. No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, questions? Yes, sir. What's the churn rate that you have? Because you mentioned before, you know, selling software as a service is now different because you don't have the top-down approach. So that means people use it and then they figure out if they like it or not. So what's your churn? So we're very proud of our retention rates, but we don't, we don't publicize numbers like that. Like the, but the thing is, of course, that we believe that good old enterprise software is all about locking in the customer, uh, long-term contracts, implementing software that is really, really hard to get out once you got it in. We don't believe in that. We believe in you know, our software should be really easy to buy, really transparent, really easy to use. Um, and if customers want to get rid of us, we want to make it really, really easy for them too. 
you know, there's a full API, there's a full banger, all these different things, and they can, you know, they can cancel from one day to the other if they want to. We believe in that we have to earn our customers' trust every single day by providing them with a great product, a great experience, and great results. Um, and I think, that's the, I think that's the future of business software because that's ultimately what we all want. We don't want to be locked in with contracts and complicated software. We want to have choice, so we believe in that, and we're very proud about our retention rates, even though they're not public. Yes, sir. You. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when, I, when I was listening to the first years of your company, you said something really struck me, which is like, um, Having a startup in Europe is seen as something cute. <laughs> and uh, as an Italian, I kind of agree. Like, uh, it is considered weird uh, to be an entrepreneur, not as a good career. So what I would ask is, like, if you had to go back tomorrow to, to Europe and maybe adopt our currency as well, given the dynamic of the accounts, what do you think you, you would do to change this risk version in, uh, in Europe? Um, so I think, like, I think definitely the climate has changed over the last five years. I think it's there's def we definitely see more capital and so on in Europe, and we also we also actually have a European investor uh, right now, Index Ventures out of London or out of Geneva, Geneva, London. some something like that. Um, so I think it's definitely changed, but like, there's no doubt that like. Silicon Valley San Francisco is a completely different place than anywhere else in the world. Like you don't, you don't find the combination of talent and experience anywhere else in the world. Like not at that density. Like when we, for example, when we hire technical operation guys, we hire people who like ran Yahoo uh, data centers or Google data centers or something like that, you know, and they're talented guys with you know, Stanford degrees and all that stuff. We don't, it's very hard to find that combination in Europe. You have access to so many other startups here just because of the density. Like networking is so easy in San Francisco, Silicon Valley. You have access to capital, of course, and then you have access to all the business development opportunities. So that's very, very unique. And you can't just replicate that in another country. Or you can maybe, but that will take you know 50 years to build that up, that ecosystem. So I think like European countries, they if they want to, if if they feel they want to play in you know in the startup kind of economy, they have to figure out what is their, you know, where do they add kind of where in the value chain can they add value, and not be afraid of kind of losing it to the American and VCs or anything like that. They have to figure out where to add value. Because I think like if, if Italian VCs or Italian government is easy, uh, is good at kind of getting startups off the ground and then many, a lot of these startups may, then may leave for the US or whatever, you know, if they got a good experience in Italy, they will come back and they will bring home their money and then they will invest more in the startup community. So I think it's a long term, uh, you know, effort that has to be done and it's like you will never it will be very hard to challenge the ecosystem that you have here in in San Francisco and Silicon Valley question up here but to challenge it a little bit on that point I mean you said that it's different or that Europe doesn't have the ecosystem for startups but at the same time as soon as your startup, your startup was big enough you left yeah and so it kind of deprived the, the, the Danish startup ecosystem of, you know, your value input. So I would be curious, kind of, what, how do you see yourself and your role as a, as a roadmap model, as a facilitator, as an advisor within the Danish ecosystem? Um, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's like, it's both cruel and wrong to put the burden of kind of the future economy of Denmark on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> like I've never like we 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 had our own dreams and we followed our dreams and that brought us here because we could live out our dreams here. I don't have like responsibilities back to Denmark for that matter. Like we set up an engineering shop in Denmark. It's a small team. We have two scrum teams, so it's 20 people in Copenhagen and we did that because we kind of still had a Danish brand and we could hire some really good people relatively easy. 
So, uh, so we did that, and I think like the easier it is to play play ball, kind of with the with kind of the the Danish, you know, bureaucracy. The easier it will be, it will be for us to invest there. But like we are a global company, like right now the best place for us to hire engineers is out of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Like the city really wanted the local government. Very easy to work with. Australia. Great, yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, great talent there, and like uh, not that many sexy new product companies. Um, so I, 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 I'm Danish. I love being back home. I love uh, Leopoldstadt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two person joke. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's. Um, but um, like it's a it's a it's a it's a global world and, and like it's you, there's no special treatment or special preference. It's everybody has to kind of show their best side and s s kind of make make the best foundation for make doing business and building companies. So one last question, Camilla. I'm running the Danish Innovation Center. <laughs> I, I can only tell you that Nicola is very modest. Because he's in fact our best role model out of Denmark. He's a VP off, and every time we need somebody to stand up and be a role model, even if it's ministers or whoever comes here, Mikkel is very, very willing to offer all his advice and all of his experience to these people. So I think you're doing a tremendous, much, you know, big deal for the Danish government, and in fact, you're hiring people in Denmark. Yes. So it couldn't be a better role model. <laughs> And I just asked this, like when I talked about how we did things approaching the markets early on versus our more strategic thinking about the markets now, was that clear? Because I never told that story to anyone before. Sure. Yeah. Was it? Ah, yeah. oh, come on. What wasn't clear? Let me know. We'll Tell me. We will be bringing Mikkel <laughs> back up at the end. Okay. After, at the end of Martin's talk. Sorry, Mikkel. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let, let us now lift the burden of yes. raising Denmark off your shoulders <laughs> and put the burden on Martin Reiter, who's come all the way from Vienna. Yep. So Martin Reiter, formerly head of international growth with Airbnb Groupon, very unusual experience across two very major, one Silicon Valley Chicago company, extensive experience in Europe, but also outside of Europe in bringing companies global. So thank you for coming. Hi. So I'm the kind of guy that guys like Mikkel usually hire, you know, when they need to figure out how to do that. Uh, some of them figure it out themselves, and you know, others they build a little bit on experience. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the more. I mean, I'm here at the engineering school. A little bit more of the technical aspects of how do you do that? Uh, how do you move? How do you make the move? And what is usually needed? And the idea is to make you, I mean, a lot of you probably will end up, most of the guys I know or heard of that are very successful entrepreneurs are actually engineers. So make you a little bit more comfortable once you might be at that stage on thinking through what that means and maybe not delaying the move too fast because that can actually get pretty expensive. Um, before, on Burton's common request, um, this is Austria. Um, so um, now. <laughs> It's, uh, it's a competitor to Denmark in that small and medium-sized country business. Um, and uh, you know, we, we tend to say that before the First World War, we were actually the leading territorial force in Europe. And that's what remains today. Um, <laughs> today, we are famous uh, for two things, the leading philharmonic orchestra in the world. Um, that's usually the one that wins the audience for me. Um, and uh, for Red Bull. So who of you knew that Red Bull was an Austrian brand? That's surprising. That's, uh, then I have a biased selection of people I talk to. Um, <laughs> now, um, why is Europe or global expansion somehow exciting to me? Um, there is this pretty hip uh, movie now, especially like here in the entrepreneur scene, uh, about Shiro, the sushi chef in Japan. And uh, he says something that is kind of um, was pretty stunning to me. He says, in order to build an excellent product, you need to have excellent taste. 
And the quality of your taste is largely a function of the variety of things you're exposed to. So just sticking around here, even though it's a very cool ecosystem, might not give you all the breadth of taste that you can discover out there. Um, now, from a more business perspective, it also matters mostly for two reasons. The first one is value creation. And the second one is there are certain products that just don't really work without being global. Now, in terms of value creation, there's this formidable Dutch company called Booking.com uh, that was acquired by Priceline. And very few people know that you can argue that Booking.com actually contributes more to the value of the company than their US um, uh, parent. So um, the other thing is, and I mean, I don't want to even elaborate on Alibaba saving Yahoo, but there are those situations where you know it might make sense to think about it. The other thing is, like, imagine you have a, a travel startup and your market is Americans travel within America. That's not a very big market, like compared to travel. Um, or you have a search engine that only searches American home pages. Um, or a social network that only connects Americans. So certain products just inherently don't work that well unless they're global. And I, there's a few of those little things here to the right which were exciting to me when I first heard about it. So when you judge it by the size of exits in the internet industry, Russia is the second biggest market in the world. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have tried to raise money, but if you're going a little bit later stage, um, DST with its founder, Yuri Milna, is actually one of the big, big ones here. And, and he certainly made his money in the Russian industri uh, tech industry. Um, now, um, Istanbul is now a, a huge market. It's the third largest metropolitan area in the world, and it's growing like a rocket. So it's kind of, you know, uh, when we talk about low-hanging fruits, this is a market where you have big catch-up in consumerism. So sometimes being a little bold, and when you're in a, a, a consumer industry, moving to those markets or Indonesia can actually make you grow at a cost that you could never ever achieve going to the UK, even though they speak your language. Um, now, Bertman, it's a good idea talking a little bit about how I got to where I am today. And uh, it, I certainly didn't know <laughs> where I was ending up. Um, I started uh, getting some masters in philosophy, law, and, uh, and economics. And already that kind of eclectic selection might tell you that I had no clue what I wanted to do later. <laughs> um, and uh, I had the next one. Um, I, I tried to travel extensively, and mostly because I was a little bit scared of what the world out there was look like. So I mean, what does it mean to backpack through Zimbabwe? I don't even, even I heard it, I picked it up somewhere, I didn't even know where that was. And so I thought, okay, I mean, the best way to get around this is probably by trying it. And the, the, the kind of bad thing was that I didn't know about Lonely Planet in the beginning, which made it literally much harder. Um, and then I, I decided, or actually fate brought me a little bit to that management consultancy business, where I actually got a very solid uh, management toolbox, which is still like very useful for me today. And then a, another destiny brought me in the hands of Oliver Samba, this you know, patron of European uh, startup culture. Um, and uh, he had a challenge. He was leading uh, Groupon's international expansion at that time, and just bought two very large companies, one in Japan and one in Russia. And he needed someone that would go there and kind of integrate them and making sure they won. And uh, so I ended up taking that job, which was uh, like, that was a lot of fun. And uh, what I learned there is um, a lot about speed. So one of the famous questions he told me was, um, why don't you do it 10 times faster? And it's a pretty stunning question, because when you think about it, mostly the answer is, there is an answer why you don't do it 10 times faster. If there wouldn't, you might be an idiot. Um, but you end up doing it three times faster, just because it tells you, look, um, I didn't think of it like that. What would it take to move 10 times faster? It's just a very powerful question when you're in startups. Um, and uh, then a couple of, uh, actually, a, a year later, uh, Brian Chesky, the CEO of Airbnb and founder, um, he kind of got hold of me and said, look, I have a challenge. Um, the guy you are working for has just cloned my business, and I have a vision. I want to bring good to the world, and he is in between me and that vision. Um, can you help me? And uh, Brian is a, a very impressive visionary person, and the business model, making sure that we share our, um, our infrastructure in a much better way, 
was thrilling. So I ended up doing that. It was the time where Airbnb just raised about $120 million. And they needed someone to spend most of that. And I had the, uh, the, the fortune of being that person, or the curse. Um, and uh, so what we did is we built 12 offices in about six months, spanning all the continents and hiring 250 people at the same time. So that was like, like <laughs> uh, internationalization at a pretty industrial scale. And uh, it worked. So there is not so much competition anymore. Um, uh, but I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and then there is one thing that, that really, really helped me as a person, um, not just helped me, it also made me pretty happy. I got married in that time. And um, the funny thing is there's rare moments where you have such an intense you know, trial and response and error with one other person. And it told me a lot about the differences in communication, that you can say something and the other person understands it's just completely different. Um, and there was this very funky story um, one of my American business partners was with me in Europe, and he had one of our team members in the US on the phone, and he was so not pleased with one thing that happened. So what he said was, look, I really would like next time to reconsider this approach. And, but by seeing his body language, he was mad like hell. Um, and so... Um, he was very, very not pleased. Um, now, if you say these exact words to a German, he would actually think, or one of my German managers, he would think, I actually thought I did pretty well. <laughs> um, and uh, so even though you both would speak English, in order for a more European culture person to understand it, you say, you just make sure you never do that again. Then they understand the message. And so that's actually one of the things why it's sometimes dangerous for American business going to the UK because they speak the same language, but not so much. Um, uh, and so um, now that I'm, um, I'm thinking more about you know, helping other companies doing that, one of the things that intrigues me a lot is physically good operations. Um, just because I come from the countryside in Austria, and I once in my life want to be really able to explain them and show them what I do. Um, so maybe, maybe we'll manage this time. Um, now, a little bit more the technical part of that. Um, I thought it might be a nice idea walking you through how you would maybe do that once you're there. Um, and maybe that can be helpful taking some of those fears or biases away. Um, I found out that there is four big things that you want to work through when you think about international. And the most important is the first one, is the why. And there's a very easy reason why that is important. Usually you need to raise money for it. And if you don't, your, your investors, they don't like it, it won't happen. Um, the next thing is, um, when do you do it? You can really get that wrong. Um, and where do you go? Um, and then, what do you actually need to adjust? Mikhail talked a little bit about you know, tailoring of product. There are certain markets and certain industries where it's pretty smooth, and it can also be really hard. And the last one is just literally, what are the different steps that you might need to go through? And I found out they're always pretty much the same. It's just the answers that are different. Um, now, um, I, th I found it helpful to look through the reasons why you want to expand from coming from your own business model. There's business models where it's really a requirement to win the global market. There's business models where it's an opportunity. It can be a very cool one. It can be a mediocre one, but it's an opportunity. And then there's business models where you can Think about competition in a way that you might want to take the oxygen out of a market that could be large enough to become a serious threat to you in a later day. Um, now, the requirement ones are the winner takes it all, uh, those famous marketplace models. Marketplaces have a good and a bad thing. The good thing is they tend towards natural monopoly. The more supply you have, the more attractive it is to demand. And the more demand you have, the more attractive it is to supply. Um, that's the good thing. The bad thing is that the one that is bigger might just in the end swallow all others. So if you are not winning Europe, which is still the largest consumer market if you consider it one, uh, it will be very hard to survive as an American business. And similar, all other businesses with strong network effects like Airbnb, as people travel all around the world, if you don't win in other parts of the world, it can actually get pretty dangerous for your home market. The second one is 
um, opportunity. Those are the businesses where your home market is somehow defensible. Think about Open Table. They kind of have their merchants and the restaurants locked in. Why should they really change? It doesn't make a lot of sense. So even they don't win Europe, their US business is pretty strong. Um, but you know, it only scales to a certain amount. Um, and the third one is, is something that is actually pretty interesting. Think about Dropbox. Um, if Dropbox would focus exclusively on one segment, let's say consumer, couldn't there another one come in and eat their enterprise stuff away? Yeah, and it actually happened. We have Box, you know. <laughs> so uh, the same can happen for geographies. Um, you all know Sappos. Um, so Sappos was acquired by Amazon for a billion. Their European clone is now valued at four billion. And it's called Zalando and it was found by Rocket Internet. There is, once you have such a high supply chain integration that you actually produce your own lines, they might be large and powerful enough to actually enter the US. Those is one of the examples where it might actually make sense to move early. Um, and it's not just this. Uh, no, thank you. Um, it's not just this. I found out that you know, it's hard for a business to scale faster than the founder himself or herself. So being exposed to a larger variety in your team, in your product, can actually make you as a person scale faster. Now, let's talk a little bit about when to enter. There is two very, very big cool things about doing it fast. The first one is a first mover advantage. It has no price tag, but it's super valuable. The more brand driven your business is, the more valuable it is. The second thing is, it's pretty funky. You can disencourage other investors to fund clones of your own business. So if Sendesk builds a large pompous office in Singapore, other investors might be pretty scared funding a competitor there. Because as a, an American strong business, planting a flag actually has very, very strong strategic meaning. Um, so those are the two ones which are in, in favor. The two ones that are a little bit more of a challenge is obviously diluting your home business. And the second one is liquidity. If your valuation is such that you, know, you need to take quite a lot of dilution to get money, you might really think if it's a good idea. Now, when you go on a time series, I found that if you have a series A, and if I get too technical, please someone shout. Um, if you have a series E that is like south of 10 million, it's just hard cutting out a few million to go international at that stage. Um, however, when you move over, um, the great idea is a, is a nice one because there are businesses which are inherently a great idea. Groupon was one of those. It's a great idea, but it's also pretty easy to execute it. So what happened was, it literally we had hundreds of clones. There was no country too small for having at least three competitors. Um, that's one of those where you really want to think about moving early. Um, now, in the middle part, you have those brand-driven businesses. Um, when you are Airbnb, and a lot of your business is around trust and organic viral growth, you want to make sure that you're perceived as the innovator. There is clones that basically go to press and claim that they came up with the idea. And once that happened, if you are then going and telling press, no, actually it was us, they think you're both a little stupid. So you want to make sure getting that one right. And then when you see the clone threat, when you are maybe too long in your home market and other clones are up and they're actually pretty good, I'm not sure, do you know the payments company Stripe? So, I mean, the Rocket Internet wants more. They have cloned them in Europe and it's working pretty smoothly. Um, for them, it will be hard now because how do you differentiate? And last, the Clone Wars. Uh, I'm not sure if a lot of you are customers of Birchbox. So Birchbox is this kind of the, the, the company that sells you small cosmetic samples at a subscription base, and it's a pretty cool idea. Um, the Samwers Rocket Internet again cloned it. It's called Glossybox. They're doing very well in Europe. If Birchbox now wants to enter and fight an established brand, where people believe they came up with the idea, it's going to be material warfare. Like, this is going to be really expensive. Um, 
I put a little bit of a rule of thumb on bottom. So entering one market, if you have le significantly less than one and a half million dollars, it's going to be risky. Just because you want to build, you want to pay for OPEX uh, and, and, and payroll for a year, then you want to give it another half a year if you know new funding round doesn't close. And then you want to have a little bit for marketing, else it's a little bit of a dry run. Now, let's move on to the where. I put together a few, like this is now the world map, the geographical knowledge. You know? um, a few thoughts that I have about different markets is that I've operated in. Um, when you look at Brazil, Brazil is an interesting market because there is a very serious success story with Peixe Urbano, which is a, a, a Groupon company, Groupon style company, that really won their market. And Brazil is just a pretty nice market to win. Like we're talking about 200 plus million people. Winning that market has enough oxygen to make you a very wealthy person. Um, the other one, um, the red one, Europe. Um, Europe has been a lot of, like, a lot of Europe has been branded by the works of Oliver Salmon and Rocket Internet. Um, what they did is they set up an incubator, which basically takes American ideas, clones them, and brings them to the European market. Um, that means for US companies going to Europe, um, the tit by tat, slow approach might be dangerous because if you just go to the UK, it's kind of, you warn them that you will go eventually to the other countries and they might be faster. So it has changed a little bit the approach that I talk to startups when you enter Europe. Um, Russia is a pretty interesting internet market for two reasons. First, they have a few large success stories, um, a few billion dollar tech companies. And the second one, um, it's a very weird country. They have Moscow, and then they have a large handful of more than one or two million people cities that are kind of remote. And whenever that happens, internet is actually a wonderful remedy. Um, and then Australia. Australia is literally the single best market I have seen for internet. The problem with it is it's also not super big. So you want to think about, do I need to do it now or do I just do it a little later? Um, and then you have Japan and China. Now, China is a little bit of a challenge because there haven't been that many foreign success stories there. Very few, actually. Um, and the other one, China, uh, uh, Japan, uh, you have Rakuten, which is one of the leading e-commerce companies, a formidable company. But apart from that, this is such a challenging country to operate in culturally. So um, even though it's great and I loved it, it's just not that easy. Um, going down a little bit more to Europe, um, I had a few um, acquaintances that said, look, um, our American mother co uh, or parent company burned through more money trying to get the UK up and running than we needed for the all rest of Europe. So um, the UK, I wouldn't actually, like just because it's easy doesn't mean it's not very expensive because everyone does it. And marketing cost, online marketing cost in the UK are just super high. The next one is, um, Germany is a pretty dangerous and competitive market for the reasons that I've discussed a lot about. Rocket is based in Berlin. Um, Scandinavia is a, it's a, it's just a stunning space. I mean, you have three, four world-class companies, but I consider Sandisk more a US company <laughs> these days. Um, but when you look at it, I mean, every time again, you have Skype, Spotify, and Klarna, all north of $1 billion and all coming from this kind of little bit more remote and small area in Europe. It's, it's stunning. Um, and uh, then you have Spain and Italy. Both of them are not doing that well, which for, um, depending on your business model, actually can be great opportunity. For Airbnb, it was formidable, because what Airbnb does, renting out your idle space gives you extra income. And that worked like fabulous in those markets. Um, and then, CEE is a very, uh, Central Eastern Europe is a stunning market because they need to catch up in consumerism. And so whatever you can do, like for example, they don't have a strong retail network. So whenever you do something which uses the internet in terms of e-commerce, of bringing them products that are cool, um, it is a market that I would strongly consider. 
Now, the third, and like uh, there's only one more to go then, uh, section is a little bit what works and what doesn't. And how much of your core product and culture can you easily bring over to other countries? And when you see a spectrum here from easy to hard, um, let's maybe quickly walk through. It's, it's stunning that I have talked to a few American companies that just want to do everything with the same organization out of San Francisco. So I'm not even sure that works for Canada, um, but it certainly won't work for the rest. Um, the next thing is, so you need to adjust your organization somehow. The next one is the culture of your operating culture, the way you interact, the way you do meetings, the way you do performance reviews with your people. Um, that works actually pretty smoothly in, uh, in Europe. It surprisingly works in Russia and Brazil. It just gets very, very different in Japan. Like there's even legal reasons why you cannot do things the way you would do it here. Um, then uh, tech. So I put Australia there. I, I don't think you need to do any changes except for the currency when you go to Australia. Um, for Europe, um, the biggest single problem that I found is if your designers have used a too brief Laura Ipsum and it doesn't work for French language because it's pretty wordy. Um, now, in Brazil and Russia, uh, depending on your product, so Brazil is pretty challenging in payment it's because you need to have a social security number to use your credit card. And doing that is just, it's a little bit of a hassle. Um, and Russia, just because they don't have good, physically good fulfillment, so there is no good FedEx in Russia. So when you are in that kind of business, it can pretty much be a showstopper. Um, now, marketing. Uh, marketing is typically the, the biggest source of cash out during a lot of phases in your, in your startup. So you really want to think about those two spectrums. I want to have control or I want to do it economically sound. Control means you do it in the US. Economically sound means you want to think about it. Just because um, most of online marketing you can procure cheapest if you procure it directly at the vendor. So going not to a display network, but to individual display providers. And just negotiating those deals is pretty hard when you're not there. So and there's more examples like that. If, you're, if your investment in online marketing is a few million dollars in the foreseeable future, I don't think there's a way around doing it out of the region you want to operate in. Um, and then um, operations, just a few things. When you set up um, your tax structure or you set up your IP or intellectual property, um, you want to be a little bit um, kind of watching into China and Russia. Um, and again, for, for payments, Germany is pretty interesting. Their payment split by channel is very different from the US. So, you know, when you offer the typical American payments there and you don't convert, um, keep it in mind. <laughs> um, now, finally, um, what would you do if your founder team now thinks, OK, it's probably a good time to think about expansion? And that can be Series A, Series B, somehow around that. Um, you want to first get your board and your investors aligned. The second thing is um, you want to basically borrow an fp and a guy and make a rough budget to know what will hit you. You certainly don't want to run out of money. Um, the third thing is you want to find leadership, a product leader and a business leader. Um, doing it without that, I mean, over time you will probably figure it out eventually, but it can be pretty expensive. Um, the fourth one is these guys then should build a playbook which kind of means what would the guys on the ground do? If I want to go into Italy, do I have a sales team there? Or do I only do online performance marketing? Where is my customer service? What, what's their, like, is there a call script? Do we use Zendesk or not, you know? I mean, those are all these kind of questions that you want to somehow answer before hitting the ground. Once that is done, you, um, you make sure you have an entity, you get an office lease, you hire the people, and you make sure you operate. Um, now, 
in the operation stage, one of the big, big challenges that I found is um, the spectrum of control that you want to keep here in San Francisco. Keeping too little control will make you not feel at ease. Keeping too much control will kind of annoy your team over there. Um, so how do you navigate that? How do you make sure you yourself as a founder are comfortable with what these guys do, but at the same time empowering them to make the right moves to conquer the market? And then um, one of the um, kind of leading investors in the Valley once told me, um, if you don't change your organization once a year, I would actually be concerned. So if you are in hyper growth stage and you grow by factor four every year um, and your org does not change, think about how fit that org would be to take the next year's 4x. So there is a lot of learning and evolution in there. Now, I already mentioned a few of them. Um, so I just want to actually take out one and six because they're somehow related. Um, the person that has built your earliest success case as a founder is usually yourself. At a stage of series A or B, you don't have a GM running your American business. That's usually yourself. So getting someone not of your caliber to figure out Europe, not being, uh, being distant from you, and knowing the industry and the business less because you founded it, I just would like you to think about that. You know? So make sure you have someone that you can trust and that is of a similar caliber as yourself just because Europe is a serious and maybe more complex market in a lot of respects than the US. Um, and from a founder perspective, um, even though you might have found a great guy to do it, you need to build your own network to make sure you have, you're not dependent on the input you get from your own team. So there is, I heard so many stories why Brazil doesn't work. And there, is, can, there can be two, two or, or Russia doesn't work. There can be two answers because what your team does is just wrong or because the market is challenging. But if you as the founder have no way putting those two things apart, you are actually getting in a pretty bad state uh, as, a ma as a manager. Um, and Burton meant it might be a good idea to talk finally about how to recruit talent internationally and particularly in Europe. And it's actually not that hard. So of course you can use an agency, but even if you use an agency, it's, they won't save you doing that because again, you can't calibrate their efforts. And so uh, the first one is you really want to think what is the right role. Is it a general manager role? Is it a sales manager role? Is it a VP role? The next thing is you get the compensation somehow right. That's not super hard. Usually Europe pays a little bit more cash. Uh, just because they are not as acquainted with the idea of stock options. Um, and stock options and stock is taxed differently. So you want to pay like between 100 and 150 K US dollars per year in cash for a general manager that does roll, help you roll out Europe um, and a decent stock package. And then for the right search, I can only encourage you to go on LinkedIn and, and play a little bit around. Look through the 100 most remarkable startups in Europe, search through profiles of their company, and you will get a feeling for what there is. And then call those people, ask them for advice. If you like them, you make them an offer. If not, you ask for referrals. That's, it's not much harder than that. That's what exec search guys do as well. OK. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Mikkel, can we ask you to come up front as, as well? Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize for the projector and issues. We haven't had these problems before with the loss of color on tables and maps. We're going to check that out. Secondly, I'd like to thank Sten Tempkivi uh, for the introduction to Martin Ryder originally. Um, let's open up initially for questions for Martin, and then we'll broaden it to include Mikkel and a De Denmark, Austria, Denmark, Europe angle. First questions. Too much content. Too much. Um, so Martin and I had a discussion last night, and I've had this discussion several times about the McKinsey style of presentation slides versus Silicon Valley style. And uh, many times I, I have to go through a significant uh, discussion with our speakers coming in about why McKinsey style, which 
tend to be very dense, does not always work, especially in presentations and sessions around startups. So I, th I thought this worked pretty well, even though we ended up missing a lot of the color graphics. Um, so Martin, you're based in Austria, but you basically were going back and forth. You were based in Berlin for a time at Rocket Internet. You were working here as well. Uh, were you in Chicago? No. Internet of Chicago uh, when you were doing Back then I was in Tokyo. You were doing in Tokyo. <laughs> okay. And of if you were a Silicon Valley startup today, let's say mm -hmm. in consumer, yeah. what would be your recommendation for European entry entry strategy or entry points? This is kind of so, a parallel question I asked um, Mikael about, but on the enterprise like side. At, know, knowing that at that level, the answer will always be wrong. Um, I would probably make sure that I enter the key European markets at the same time so that you don't have your lunch eaten away by a competitor there. Um, so that would probably mean Germany, France, UK. Um, and then Italy and Spain, I would say, is a little bit less critical. Um, and uh, I mean, there's, there's less risk that a competitor will kill you out of there, which is very serious if you think about those other three. Um, I would make sure that it's well funded, it's well set up, um, and then after half a year, I would kind of reevaluate and probably start raising a new round and making it pretty big. Okay. And what are, what are the most common mistakes you've seen U.S. startups make when going into Europe? You, you touched on a little bit of them, but can you pull those together? So I think that it's a pretty serious thing, and a lot of them try to get around it being serious by doing a no regret, kind of a, an easy regrettable move where they just say, let's put a few chips on the table and let's just see how it goes. That usually doesn't work. So it's the, the money is kind of wasted. Um, if you don't have a part of your organization that would kind of do the win or fail question, so my role is it to either win Europe or I fail and I leave, uh, it's hard to be serious enough to win, I think. Questions? Yes. This is for Martin. Uh, what is your take? I know you're focused in Europe, but what is your take in the rest of Latin America? You spoke about Brazil, but not the rest of Latin America. Yeah. Um, so the reason there is pretty easy. Uh, we, we had operations. Um, we had our, our regional hub in Sao Paulo, um, which was mostly for anti-competitive reasons, because Brazil has enough oxygen to keep a competitor wealthy. Um, but then. Uh, Buenos Aires is a very remarkable city, I think, for tech. And uh, I've been there a couple of times. I think those are pretty dynamic. Uh, there's a pretty dynamic market. Colombia, Colombia's consumer potential is evolving back after unrest in the, like, after the unrest has, sorry, has stopped. Um, so that's a very interesting market. Mexico is a little bit more, and I'm, I know it's middle America, but it's a little bit more challenging due to, again, unrest in the recent years. Um, in a nutshell, I would probably try in the beginning um, doing um, Argentina, Colombia, and um, Chile, also out of Sao Paulo, but I wouldn't forget about them. Denmark versus Austria. Now, you and I had a little bit of discussion last night about the Austrian ecosystem, and we didn't bring you on here to talk about Austria per se. But would you recommend Valley Startups to jump into Austria as an early starting point? <laughs> so, so I'm now between a rock and a hard place. So um, um, I would want to think about that maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, have, do you have guys have any comments or regarding the differences about what's going on in Denmark versus Austria today? I just came back from two days in Vienna last week. It was too short to really get a sense of what's going on there, but my sense is that Austria is a bit behind other European countries. Th in, thanks for pointing <laughs> it out there. <laughs> uh, not, not, at the, not at the bottom, but in terms of the strength of the angel investor ecosystem, venture capital, startup spin-outs from universities, not as far along as Denmark is. Um, do you see any opportunities uh, for building bridges between Austria and Silicon Valley at this point? That, so that I, I personally, I think that one of the 
biggest wealth creating moves um, in Europe that you can do in a, as a government is just build more engineering schools and, and tell students that they shouldn't study law uh, or, uh, 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 or uh, make uh, an MBA. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, it's just, I mean, look, you, any, any decent engineer laughs at any decent lawyer these days. And it's just a problem that parents still think my, my, my child should do something solid and so medicine or you know something of that. Those are all low paid, mediocre kind of jobs when you compare them to engineers. <laughs> uh, and the challenge is that, um, that Austria is a little bit lagging behind. Uh, Germany and Berlin has the Hasso Plattner Institute, which has done a better job in that. Um, and SAP in general has just hired so many engineers that there is kind of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, so if Austria could do that, I think the rest would follow. And Mikkel, any comments on what you think where Denmark can strengthen its ecosystem? Um, so um, <clears throat> personally, I, I think I was very inspired by my first visit to San Francisco, and this was back in 95. Uh, so in 95, you, it was just possible to get an email you know, like a dial up and an email. And we were, I think we were like 90 people who had it in, in Denmark. Um, and I was, and I flew into San Francisco and I drew up the 101 and I saw these billboards with web addresses. And you, I've stayed with some friends and they ordered food online and all these crazy things. And it's just like, I think like, well, what? It's amazing. I learned so much, like it was like a big eye opener for me. Uh, this is 95. Um, so I think, um, Last year, there was a direct flight open between Copenhagen and San Francisco, and I think that will mean more than a lot of other things that you can do. Just get people to get off their butts <laughs> and travel and see the world and be inspired and then do with that what they want to do. Uh, maybe you know, take a course here at Stanford or, or, or go home and start their school or start their thing or whatever. I think like, uh, uh, Spending time learning from that and, and meeting people like you guys and a lot of the, the startup community here and so on. I think that's what inspires people and ultimately makes people want to do stuff. Would you recommend building more law schools in Denmark? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that. So I am very, very happy about the general counsel of my company. Keeps us out of trouble and keeps me out of jail, but also <laughs> Um, but also, I think, you know, uh, and that's another thing, like to really, you know, succeed with a company today, whether that be in San Francisco or Silicon Valley or the rest of the world, a lot of legisla legislation, a lot of regulations and so on you have to deal with. So you need good lawyers too. Sorry. So <laughs> we, we have to wrap up now. Mikkel and Martin, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, remind you that next Monday, and Martin, thank you very much Thanks, for coming Martin. all the way from Vienna. Remind you that next Monday is UK and Croatia equity crowdfunding and ag tech startups in Europe. Same time, same place. Please join us. Thank you. Nice meeting you. It's a pleasure.